calorimetry. Calorimetry simply means heat studies. If you went to the lab and you'd do this, you would do what we call coffee cup calorimetry. Now, coffee cup calorimetry, what we're doing when we do coffee cup calorimetry is we're taking and we're doing heat exchange in an open container. And the open container is relevant. Open container allows us to work in a safe environment where we are not going to have pressure times a change in volume. And in fact, we're going to work at constant pressure. So heat studies. Heat capacity, capital C. Heat capacity is a measure of how hot or cold a body or an object gets when it experiences heat. So for example, if you have a coffee cup in your cabinet, and you maybe have a couple different kinds, and one of them you put in the microwave and you notice the cup itself gets very hot, it would have a low heat capacity. It would be easy to heat up. If you have a different coffee cup that when you put it in the microwave doesn't get it particularly hot, then it is going to have a higher heat capacity, being more difficult to heat up. The heat capacity, by definition, capital C, is equal to the amount of heat it takes to get a certain change in temperature or heat for an object is going to equal the heat capacity, how hard or easy it is to heat something up, multiplied by delta T. Different coffee cups would have a different heat capacity. Now, when we have a quantity of something that we weigh, we instead use specific heat capacity. This is tabulated by a lot of textbooks as C sub S to make it different from the capital C. Now, specific heat capacity, by definition, C sub S, is equal to the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So, for example, the specific heat capacity of water is either equal to one calorie per gram degree Celsius or 4.184 joules gram degree Celsius. Now water is hard to heat up. Um, if you have a different substance like copper, it is much easier to heat up. Now this is going to depend on how much you weigh out. The specific heat capacity itself is a constant, but the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of something is going to depend on how much of it you have. But the specific heat of water is constant. One calorie per gram degree Celsius or 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. We can look up tables of specific heat capacities. Water is a liquid, which is something we're going to use all the time, has a specific heat capacity given to be 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. If we have a pot of water on the stove and we're looking at the temperature, we note that the pot itself heats up much faster than the water does. And that is because the pot might be made of copper. Copper has a very low specific heat capacity. So copper is easy to heat. And water itself at 4.184 is much harder to heat and holds heat much better than metal does. We can calculate heat of a substance, a measurable amount, by using the specific heat capacity. And we will get here that the heat is equal to the specific heat capacity multiplied by the mass of something times the change in temperature. We are always going to find change in temperature, and this is a delta. Delta means change, and change is always going to be final minus initial. We have to do it in the right order so that we can keep um, track of the sign. So for example, if the temperature final is greater than the temperature initial, then delta T is positive. If delta T is positive, then Q is positive, and the reaction is endothermic if heat goes in. If T final is less than T initial, then delta T is negative. If delta T is negative, then Q is negative. And when Q is negative, the reaction is exothermic, and heat goes out. So we can do some math. How much heat is going to be absorbed when 800 grams of water increases in temperature from 21 to 85 degrees Celsius. 
Well, we want the heat. We know that heat is equal to the mass times the specific heat capacity times delta T, which is equal to 800 grams. Specific heat capacity would we would look up 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Delta T is T final, which is 85 degrees Celsius minus 21. And when we solve for that, we are going to get Q, the total heat is going to equal 214000 joules, or, and we frequently put these in kilojoules, 214 kilojoules. Remember that there are 1,000 joules per kilojoules. The temperature is going up, so the Q is positive, and this reaction is endothermic. Now, to apply the first law of thermodynamics, and the first law of thermodynamics tells us that heat is conserved or energy is conserved, meaning any energy that is lost has to be gained by something. So what we are going to define is our system and our surroundings. Our system we're going to be defined as whatever is undergoing chemical or physical change. That is going to be our reaction when we do some chemistry. The surroundings are everything else around it that either provides or absorbs heat from the system or the reaction. And this is going to tell us that the heat of the system plus the heat of the surroundings by the definition of the first law of thermodynamics has to equal zero because heat is not lost or gained, just transferred. If we want to measure heat in a reaction, we use a calorimeter. Calorimeter has got multiple things that we can use, but frequently it is as simple as a styrofoam cup and a thermometer. And we simply measure the temperature that's lost by something and gained by something else. So remembering here, if the reaction is exothermic, heat by, produced by the reaction is absorbed by the solution. What do we mean by the solution? Well, if we put this in water and we put some chemicals in the water, the chemicals, when they reacted, would lose energy to the water. If the reaction is endothermic, then the temperature of the water would go down, heat would go into the reaction. If the reaction was exothermic, the water here, the temperature of which would go up. Remembering that exo means that the system loses heat, endo means the system gains heat, and the solution, or us, as we do a reaction, are the surroundings. So in an exothermic process, the temperature of the surrounding goes up. In an endothermic process, heat goes from the surroundings into the system, and the temperature of the surroundings, which is what we measure, will go down. So let's look at a problem where we take a piece of metal and we put it into some water, and we look at how much heat the metal loses into the water. And in here, we're going to define one of them as the system and the other as the surroundings, and they will take an equal equilibrate until the temperature of the two are both the same. So let's imagine that we have a piece of metal of a mass of 360 grams. It is put into 425 mils of water. Remember that the density of water is one gram per mil, so that means it's 425 grams. And the initial temperature of the water is 24 degrees Celsius. So what we have here is some water. We have 425 grams of water. And its initial temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. We're going to take and we're going to put into this water a piece of hot metal. So our metal here has a mass of 360 grams. We are told that the specific heat capacity, hang on a second, we're told that it's iron. Well, if it's iron, we better figure out the specific heat capacity. The specific heat capacity of iron we can look up, and it has a specific heat capacity of 4.449 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And we're told that at the end of this reaction, the final temperature for both of these is equal to 28.7 degrees Celsius. All right, so what do we know? We know that the metal is losing. So we know that the heat of the metal 
plus the heat of the water will equal zero. The metal is going to lose heat. The water is going to gain heat. And when we sum up those two Qs, we're going to get a value of zero. So at this point, it's a fair bit of math. We're going to take 300, 360 grams of metal, multiply by its specific heat capacity, which we would look up, 0.449 joules per gram degrees Celsius. We know our Q here. Q is equal to mass specific heat capacity delta T. Delta T is T final. T final for this is 28.7 degrees Celsius minus what we don't know for our metal is T initial. Now, when we add that to the water, the water is 425 grams. Specific capacity 4.84 joules per gram degrees Celsius multiplied by T final. 28.7 minus 24, and that sum of those two will equal zero. So we're going to have to take and sort the math out. When I sort the math out on this piece right here, I'm going to get that I have 83.58 joules for the water. That's going to be absorbed. Plus, if I multiply these two together, I'm going to get 162 for that um, product multiplied by 28.7 degrees Celsius minus T sub I plus the heat that's absorbed by the water is equal to zero. So let's finish this up. 162 joules degrees Celsius times 28.7 degrees Celsius minus T sub I plus the heat absorbed by the water, which is 83.8 joules, is equal to zero. When I multiply this through on the uh, metal portion, I'm going to get 46.49 joules minus 162 times joules degrees Celsius times the initial temperature, plus 83.58 is equal to zero. If I combine like terms, and put this over on this side, I'm going to get 162 joules per degree Celsius times T sub I is equal to a total of 13,007 joules. If I divide both sides by 162, I'm going to get T sub I is equal to 80.33 Celsius. And the heat that is lost by the metal plus the heat that is gained by the water equals zero, assuming that no heat is lost to the styrofoam cup or the other surroundings. So what are we going to do? We're going to do the same thing if we're going to do in a chemical reaction. The key here is that energy or heat is neither created nor destroyed. It is simply transferred. Now, if it's going to be transferred, it's going to tell us that the heat that is involved in the system plus the heat that's involved in the surroundings is equal to zero. But our system is our reaction, so we're going to call it Q of the reaction. We shorthand that as Rxn plus, well, we frequently do this in water. And when we do this in water, we're going to get a nice homogeneous mixture. And we're going to call that Q of the solution. And if we take Q of the reaction plus Q of the solution, they're going to add up to give us a value of zero. So if Q reaction plus Q solution is equal to zero, what we're going to find is that we cannot measure Q of the reaction. That is an unknown. But what we can measure is how hot or how cold the water that the reaction took place in um, got by putting a thermometer in there. Well, if we can measure this, then we know that whatever this is, the reaction has to have the opposite sign. So Q for the reaction is going to equal negative Q of the solution. So this is the heart of all calorimetry problems. So the only way to do this is to do this. So we have 50 mils of hydrochloric acid. We have a concentration of one molar, and it is at a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. And we have 50 mils of one molar 
NaOH, HCl, and it's also at 22 degrees Celsius. If we take and we mix them together, we are now going to have 100 mils of a solution. Now note the HCl is going to react with the NaOH, and when it does that, it's going to make salt water. So this is going to be 100 mils of salt water. Now all acid base neutralization is exothermic, so heat is produced. So our question here is, first of all, A, how much heat is produced? So we're going to find Q of the solution. Why? Because we can measure the change in temperature of the solution. We know that's going to equal the difference opposite sign of Q of the reaction. And then we're going to take this one step further and we're going to find delta H. Delta H will define on the next video, but for the note here, delta H is equal to the heat involved divided by the number of moles. So what do we need? Q of the solution, and we'd stick a thermometer right in here to figure this out, is going to equal the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. And we're given some values. We're given the specific heat capacity of this. We're given that the T final for our salt water here is 28.9 degrees Celsius. And we're told here that the density of this is going to be the same as the density of water. So we can run through and do this reaction. So if we have 100 mils of solution, and we assume that the density is 1, so we have 100 grams of solution, we're given that the specific heat capacity for this solution is 3.87 joules per gram degree Celsius. A salt solution is easier to heat up than straight water is. We're given that T initial is 22 degrees Celsius. T final here is equal to 28.9 degrees Celsius. So with this, we can figure out how much heat was gained by the solution. Q is equal to mass specific heat capacity delta T. So 100 grams multiplied by 4. Point, excuse me, 3.87 joules per gram degree Celsius multiplied by delta T, 28.9 minus 22 degrees Celsius, here is going to equal Q. When we finish up to do the math, we're going to get Q is equal to 2890 joules. Now, this is the Q of the resulting solution. Well, the heat that was absorbed by the resulting solution came from the reaction. So Q of the reaction is going to equal minus 2890 joules. And the last thing that we want out of this mess is a delta H, that is a change in enthalpy. Enthalpy, by the way, is simply Q normalized to moles. Note our reaction was one to one to one. We had 50 mils of one molar HCl. We also had 50 mils of one molar. NaOH. Because these are one to one, we're just going to look at one of them. And so our moles will equal 0 0.050 liters multiplied by one molar. And that's going to be 0 0.05 moles. Remember that moles are volume times molarity. So our delta H is going to be minus 2890 joules over 0 0.050 mole. And that's going to give us a value of minus 50. 7800 joules per mole. Delta H being our heat for the reaction normalized or divided by the number of moles.